Let me formally welcome everybody to the Natural, Sti the Natural Start Alliance's third and final webinar of this, uh, this spring, or this winter, I should say. This one today is going to be on documenting and assessing learning. My name is Dave Catlin, and I'm going to be your host for, for this webinar, and I hope perhaps for some future ones that are as yet unscheduled. Um, and I mentioned I'm coming to you from the central time zone, specifically Springfield, Missouri is, is my base. Um, before we actually get started and, and welcome our guest presenter today, I'd like to give all of you a little bit of a sense of, of how the mechanics of this operate. Some of you have been in on the other webinars that we've done, or really if you've been on, on any webinars in the past, you, you kind of know the drill. Um, first of all, as I mentioned a little bit earlier to those of you who arrived earlier, Everybody who's a participant is on mute, so we can't hear you, and that means you can cough or, or uh, have lunch or, or slurp coffee or whatever you choose to do um, in, uh, in secure in the knowledge that you're not going to be disturbing us. Uh, on the other hand, you do have a way to communicate with us, as many of you have already discovered here, and that is that in the upper left-hand part of your screen, there's a chat room button. And that's how you can communicate. You can communicate with us, those of us who are panelists, and you can also talk to all of your peers who are participating uh, as uh, as viewers of this webinar. And um, I would uh, I would certainly encourage you to do that. One of the things that um, often comes up in these webinars is that people have questions, and the webinars are structured so that there's going to be a time period left at the end for us to try and address at least as many of the questions that come up as, as we can. And um, so you can hold your questions until that time if you, if you want to, uh, or if you feel like you're going to forget them, uh, you're certainly more than welcome to type them into the chat box when they occur to you. And we may not answer them right when you type them then, but we'll, we will consider them when we get to the end. My experience on these webinars is that we get a lot of questions. We don't necessarily have time to answer them all. We will try to answer the ones that, particularly ones that are asked in more than one time. And, um, and then uh, oftentimes our speakers are willing to follow up with you individually and, and we'll see if that's the case again today. Um, the other thing that I will tell you that's important to know uh, is that this session is being recorded and so all of you who are on it will receive an email with the link to that recording. Uh, that it takes a little bit of time to get, uh, get put up on the web. So it's probably going to be tomorrow sometime that you will get that recording. And so what that means is there's, you don't have to worry about copying down every bullet point or, or web address or, or um, uh, intriguing quote that you might uh, see on the screen. You can always go back tomorrow and pull this session up and, and review it at your leisure. Uh, finally, at the end, um, there are a couple of other sort of homework things, homework for us, really more than for you. One is going to be a little bit more detail about the in-person trainings that the Natural Start Alliance is offering through their official training sites, three of, three of them around the country. And we'll give you a little bit of information on those uh, full day trainings. The same guest presenters uh, that you have been listening to and watching on these, um, these webinars are going to be doing those presentations in a full day format with a lot more interactive and hands-on elements uh, coming up over the following months through now through the end of June. And we'll give you more details about that at the end. And then at the same time, We'll also ask you to take a quick survey and give us some feedback. Uh, that always helps us uh, in our planning in the future. Uh, among other things, we'll ask you for other topics that you would like us to cover, but that we have not yet done so. Okay, well, let's, let's get ready to start on the official part of our webinar. Now, lots of people just feel good about young children, young children spending time in nature. Uh, others though, and increasingly, I think, want to understand the evidence that that time spent in nature is actually meaningful. 
actually has a contrib makes a contribution to the child's development. And happily, there, there are ways to do that. And that's what we're going to be exploring today. Our presenter today is a former public school teacher who became inspired by the promise of teaching in and with nature. Her academic training was in elementary and early childhood education, while her hands-on experience with the natural side of things has been at the Irvine Nature Center outside of Baltimore, Maryland. There she's worked in parent-child programs, the nature preschool that they have there at Irvine, homeschool programs, and she's now the lead guide for a new forest kindergarten inspired class. And she has an additional perspective to share with us, and that's as the mother of two preschool age children. She'll tell you a little bit more of her background uh, just as we get into this webinar, um, and she'll tell us a whole lot more through the course of the webinar. So let me get out of the way and welcome our special guest presenter today, Paula Jackson. Thank you, Dave. Hi, everybody. Welcome to documentation and assessment. It comes naturally. Like Dave said, I'm your speaker, Paula Jackson, and I'll be guiding you through the fun-filled world of documenting progress in your program. So like Dave said, I'm from the Irvine Nature Center in the greater Baltimore area of Maryland. Um, we have about 200 acres that have been donated to us, and within those acres, we're home to many field trips, urban outreach programs, eat, drink, and learn series, birthday parties, weddings, seasonal events, homeschool programs, scouts, volunteer opportunities, summer camps, the list goes on. But there's one particular standout program that's kind of our pride and joy, and I'm not being biased, our wonderful nature preschool and new forest kindergarten model program. Uh, it was built out of similar core beliefs such as Reggio Emilia, Waldorf schooling, Montessori, and the child-led learning types of, of, of schooling. The preschool opened its doors in 2010 and continues to thrive as a keystone of the Nature Center. So there's always a full enrollment and there's always a wait list. So that's good news for us. There I am. Uh, like Dave said, I graduated from, the, from Notre Dame Maryland University in elementary, early childhood, and special education. And I got drawn to Irvine because I really liked Irvine's philosophy, the importance of environmental literacy and teaching with children and the explore, respect, protect um, kind of mantra that Irvine had as their mission statement. And I kind of fell in love with it and ended up leaving public school for it. Um, and like Dave said, I've worked in the nature preschool, parent-child program, summer camps, and the head and the head guide of the forest kindergarten model program. Uh, we also do a nature preschool conference, which is a meeting of the minds that happens every summer, every June, and um, lots of people from all over the country come and, and we share ideas and we have speakers and it's a great time and I always work that event. Um, I've done various professional developments and outreach to people who kind of want to start nature in their programs and don't know how to start or how to get people on board. And then um, I volunteer at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So I'm really in this space. Plus Dave said I have two small kids. So I live in this world of preschool age kids. Uh, there's Irvine. Uh, what I wish it looked like right now, because I know it's kind of taboo to say, but I'm really into the cold. I really enjoy the cold weather. But this is a really beautiful picture of Irvine. Some other winter, there's our building and there's our, um, our the entrance to our outdoor classroom where the kids usually start their day and then a little trail sign there. And so enough about me, let's hear about you. Where's your habitat? I know Dave was kind of sounding off for people um, about where they're from and uh, what part of the region, what region are you in? I'm curious. Um, there should be a poll that's going to pop up and you can tell me where you're from. That poll is, is up and visible to, uh, should be to everybody and people are responding actually quite quickly. I'm just going to give you yeah. a few more, a few more seconds to do so. And, um, still, still coming in. It looks like we've gotten almost Almost everybody who's on the uh, on the webinar to respond. Uh, another two or three seconds. Okay, and so now we'll reveal it to the rest of you. And so, thirty-seven percent of you are in the eastern U.S. Twenty-eight percent are in the Midwest. 
13% have uh, clicked on southern U.S., 15% western U.S., 4% in Canada, and uh, we have a couple of people who clicked on other. So um, I'm oh. assuming that, yeah, the other is either they, they couldn't quite uh, assign themselves to one of these others, uh, um, and we may, uh, if, they're, um, if they are so inclined, uh, ask them to go ahead and type in. I'm just kind of curious. We've had some folks from Brazil and Great Britain and other things, other places on this. Uh, wow. In the past, but so maybe they'll let us know. Well, to all you East Coasters, you know, I hope you're enjoying the unseasonably warm weather. And the Midwest, how's it doing in the Midwest, Dave? Is it, how's the weather there? Is it? Uh, it's, it's been unseasonably warm here, too, at least in the lower part of the Midwest in Missouri. Wow. So I'd just like to know where everybody's from. So when I talk about things, I can make sure to, to think about all landscapes and all different areas that you guys are teaching outdoors, not just the Eastern uh, U.S. where I'm from, but uh, I like to think about other places where people are from and, and their landscapes they teach, they teach in. Okay, so welcome everybody, wherever you are. Um, one of the things I like to do when I start my talks is to help get into that little pocket of thinking about nature. Right now, we're all sitting and staring at this PowerPoint in our computers, and we're sort of disconnected from nature, unless you're doing this outside on your laptop. So what I like to do is I like to just take a minute and think about your favorite outdoor memory. It could be a time with your family or a time with friends or neighbors and just bring back that feeling. And when I do this for my other, um, for my other, when I do this in person with people, it usually sparks a great conversation about all these really positive memories we have about nature and our childhood. So if you have that, whatever you're feeling or whatever you're thinking, let that time remind you as to why we do this or why I do this and what can be gained from adding nature education to your curriculum if you haven't already or just to re-inspire you as to why you chose nature education. So today's goals, we're going to first, we're going to make a garden about documentation and assessment. First, we're going to plant the seeds. Before we can gather data to show the parents, we have to assess ourselves in the job we're doing. Um, are you in compliance with your mission statement? Are you properly setting the stage with your motives and goals for your program? What is a teacher's role? And our, in our in-person sessions, we'll take a look at different standard curriculums and all the hard and fast evidence that goes along with, with, with planning your lessons. Um, but for now, we'll just kind of be brief about it. Um, how students cultivate the, the data. How do we cultivate learning? How do the students show us their learning? In the world of older children and testing, it can be pretty easy to show, okay, you're learning because this and this happened and I can graph it and I can chart it. But for younger children in the preschool and kindergarten age, it's a whole new garden to plant. It's very different and it's not so hard and fast and it's not so input output. It's very multifaceted. And then we're going to harvest our garden. We're going to harvest the presentable documentation pieces to share. How do, you sh how do you make it into something measurable? And then sharing the bounty by including the families in your processes. So what is documentation? Documentation is seen as visible listening as the construction of traces through notes, slides, videos, and so on that not only testify to the children's learning paths and processes, but also make them possible because they are visible. Making them visible, learning can be visible through different lenses. Kids will show you that really quickly. It's our job as educators to capture all the different ways that kids can show us their learning. You may or not, may not be aware of the different types of learning from Howard Gardner, the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, all those different types of learning. And the thing about nature education that I really like and it, it gives way to all of these, sometimes simultaneously. So you have to be kind of on your toes because you never know what, you know, what the kids are going to show you and what traces they're going to give you. And it can require a lot of knowing where and how to look for it. And one of the things that made me love Irvine and love nature education was the fact that you know, it, it was really neat to see those traces. It was really neat to see the fruits of your labor every day in lots of different ways. 
So how can we help children find the meaning of what they do and they encounter and what they experience? So something to keep in mind. Planting the seeds. Woo, there went that slide. Planting the seeds. First, we should look at a teacher's role. So Loris Malaguzzi, who is the father of the Reggio Emilio approach, makes reference to how teachers should not only facilitate learning in the sense of making it easy for children to learn, but to rather stimulate learning by making problems more complex and engaging. Example, not jumping in, giving things more than one solution. While a teacher is present to entertain, we're, we're entertainers, if you're a teacher, if you're not a teacher, it's, it's fun to be entertaining when you present your information. We're not entertainers or information givers. We can entertain and we can give information, but we're not entertainers and information givers. That part of that falls into the multifaceted approach I was talking about with, with the children. Um, I can tell you how to do it, show you how to do it, or give you the tools to help you make meaning of it. And for me, documentation in the outdoors was a welcome alternative to a more standard system, which I'd been taught in public schools. Um, I like covering the domains, the different dimensions of everything. Uh, when learning objectives are not given at the start of a project, the children are free to learn at their own pace and make meaning of their own, in their own ways. Um, we'll get that, we'll get to that when we talk about child-led learning. All right, this is a, a rubric written by uh, Patty Bailey. Um, she came and visited our preschool and did a, uh, did a, she was a speaker at the preschool and she works at the University of Maine, Farmington, and she studies and interviews and observes many preschools. And she compiled this data. And this data um, is just basically for your center and what your goals are. Do your, does your program align with these uh, nature standards? And they don't have to do all of them, but this is something to keep in mind when you share for, with your staff or with your, with your director. So is, your curriculum play-based? Is it seasonally based? These are some things that just are kind of the broad um, things that you should be doing or you should be thinking about doing if you wanna do um, the, your nature education piece. Do you begin the day outside? Do you have a lot of unstructured time? Um, so poll number one. <laughs> okay. <coughs> How do you feel about the mud? <laughs> you can see this little girl loves it. How do you feel about it? So the, I've opened the poll and people are, are responding to a, a pretty simple, a pretty simple question. A mm -hmm. question. So I'm only going to give you just a few seconds to sure. do that. And, um, and we'll go ahead and close that polling here in a second. and share the results and probably not terribly surprising. Mm -hmm. We have 91% who think of mud pies. It's not only su not surprising, but it's, it's gratifying. Woohoo! Yay! So, if there's any audience we would want to say mud pies rather than stick in the mud, this is probably the one. <laughs> and if you're not comfortable with, with you know, mud and nature, it can be done gradually. We, there are some children who are not comfortable with Splashing and splashing in the mud, and you know it's it's a process that you can you can start little and and go bigger. And the reason I, I asked this question was because um, the second part of the rubric was how is your staff how does your staff respond to the outdoors? Is your staff excited about nature? Are they excited about a rainy day? I know with my kids, if you use the wrong verbiage, what happens is you say, oh no, we can't, or it's really cold out today, and that sort of sets the stage to Maybe I don't want to go outside today because it's really maybe too cold. So if you have a good up outlook on the weather and you have a good outlook on being in the outdoors, you know, your children will follow suit. Their little mirrors and their little sponges. And, you know, if you say it's too cold, then it's going to be too cold for them, whether, they, whether it is or not. So here's an example of a positive staff. There's me and uh, my co-teacher, Ms. Sophie. And there's our class on a particularly pouring, rainy day. We were all soaked through our stuff. We, you can really see how weatherproof some of your stuff is or isn't. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a good time, so the children have a good time. 
uh, your environment. Are you using diverse textures? Are you um, using nature, natural materials? Are you searching out different habitats on your property? So how is your environment? Here we have diver diverse open-ended provocations. Here um, at the top, you can see you know, a provocation, which is an invitation to play of birds and flowers. Are we expecting them to draw birds and flowers? Maybe, but the first thing we can look at is, are they using similar colors? What about those shapes? You know, what, what do they think about it when you ask them about this? And you've got natural materials here. How do these logs have an invitation? What the invitation for building, but what else could you make with them? It's open-ended. And then of course, Play-Doh with natural materials, always a classic favorite. And then your effective use of your outdoor space. You have, if you have a wooded area or if you have just a blanket to lay outside and look up, you can lay on it and look up no matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you have nature in your program or uh, natural spaces in your program or not. Um, fields, meadows and grasses and um, there's us exploring a giant concrete tunnel. And the parents and community is the last piece. Um, are you involving your parents? Are you having workshops? Are you keeping them up to date on the things that we're learning about nature education? And there's, uh, there's our flower ceremony. We all dressed as birds and sang to our parents. And there's a campfire that we have every year um, where they, they get to, kids get to show them where they, the parents, where they hike. And then for our forest kindergarten model, we have gathering days the last Thursday of every month where everybody gets together and shares a meal. <clears throat> so the seven domains of early childhood development, spiritual and moral, language, cognitive, gross motor, fine motor, self-help and adaptive, and social and emotional. And when we plan for our time out in the woods and our time outside, we're planning with these domains in mind. Second poll. And let me go ahead and pull this one up for everybody very quick. What do you think is the most absorbing way of learning? Actually, this is the, this is the one on worksheets. You want me to go to the other one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So which of these teaching practices do you think yields the greatest absorption of content. This, uh, this doesn't seem like a real stumper for people. Of course. <laughs> I'm only going to give you just a few more seconds to respond. And I'm going to go ahead then and share those results. 99% <laughs> practice by doing. Of uh, course. Yes, and actually it's a trick question because the answer is teaching others, but uh, for kids' sakes and for the sake of this argument, um, practice by doing obviously is, is going to give you more um, measurable data. More, the more data you have, the more you'll be able to measure. And a lot of, you get a lot of information about the whole child when you see the child doing rather than just an input, an output, an input, an output like worksheets would, would, would give you. And lecture being 5%, I'm making sure to be including to you guys, so we're not just sitting here lecturing, but you also are reading and you're getting your audiovisual and um, you're hearing about demonstrations. So we're on that passive teaching method, we're at the top. Um, but for kids, yes, practice by doing. So here's our lesson plan. I'm sorry I couldn't make it bigger, but um, we add to it every Friday and it's basically an idea dump and we fit it into each domain based on the theme we decide. And we go with the seasons. Uh, here you can see the season is fall. And a lot of the indoor activities are based on the provocations which I showed you about with those birds and flowers. And we have an idea of how to set up a provocation, but we see just how students respond to it. The outdoor time, we might sprinkle in some of those into the landscape, a little provocation, something that looks really enticing but in no, it's no means something that is necessary to do. So here you can see it's fall and big surprise, there's a big abundance of leaves outside. So um, a lot of the things that we did in those nature domains have to do with leaves. 
songs about leaves, manipulations with leaves. So how can, so now that we've, we've got planning in mind, we're thinking about those seven domains, we're planting those seeds, how can students cultivate the data? How can they show us that they're learning? Here's the poll about worksheets. <laughs> Okay, coming up here. Okay, just a quick two option choice. Mm -hmm. Do you use worksheets to gather information about your class? And just a few more seconds, and we'll get there. I think we've gotten most, most everybody to respond here who's bored. A couple more seconds. And we'll go ahead and close that and share it. And as you can see, HIS gets 73%, Tweet gets 27%. So um, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more diverse sure. a response than the last time. Well, and I'm not here to say that worksheets are terrible because we do use some things that are printed on sheets when we use our indoor stuff, especially with letters, because that seems to be um, a really quick and easy way in one of our imagination stations or places with provocations to, to have them exposed to those letters. So I'm not saying, you know, hiss on you if you, do, if you use worksheets, but I'm just here to offer um, some alternative methods. Here you can see um, we actually have these little tiles and they actually are letters and it's kind of like a Scrabble board. That's really a, a cool way that we, we, uh, we use letters in our program. So um, each child has um, a journal. Um, they often use it indoors and out. Um, and it's mostly just free reign for them to do with, if they feel like mark making, it's their time to do mark making. Um, like I had mentioned before, student interest and student led, and I'll get to that in a moment. Wild nature play is 50% of our time, and it's a great time to let the kids do wild nature play, which is where you're a passive observer. And that's, that's really great when you're documenting, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. And response to the provocations, the indoor invitations to play. Oh, and loose work samples. I came up like, like separately. All right. So here we have a little boy who um, on this day, we got our journals out and let's just say for the sake of argument, because I don't remember that I was going to ask them to make a letter G out of grass. That was my goal. Let's make a letter G out of the grass because we're talking about the letter G and see what happened. We have a, the, ch the children decided they were going to smash berries and seeds into their journal. Now, the natural instincts of teachers of order, and I have them with my children especially, uh, you try to form a lesson around this, saying, let's smash this one and talk about it. This is a pokeberry. It comes out in the early summer, and it's poisonous to humans, and A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So, um, some students might be ready for this kind of learning. Uh, with my kindergarten group, they're ready to start the plant identification, the taping a leaf into the journal and writing the name of it, the uses of it, if it's edible. My kids love to talk about what's edible, Ms. Paula. Uh, but here, what things could we assume he might be learning? Well, you see berries smashed in the journal and the first thing I think of is colors. What colors do you see here? What about the juiciest berries? Some of them look like they've been a little, they're a little juicier than others. I wonder what this berry is called. Look at the shape of this berry. Did we find these berries in the meadow? I wonder which berries we can find in the forest. Um, so this can kind of give way to a whole other, like I said before, multifaceted, think on your toes kind of uh, situation. Whereas, you know, I really wanted to make that letter G out of grass because that would have looked really neat in their journals. But, you know, a whole new lesson emerged and there was things to be learned there. Um, like we said in our poll, hands-on opportunities, I can't fool you guys, provides more opportunities for data. So 
Um, we do have a calendar inside and we do have a weather watcher. We ask the weather watcher what the weather is, which is fine, but giving way to a lot more opportunities if we go outside in the weather. So when it's rainy, how does the ground feel? Is the ground softer or harder in the winter? When it's windy, <clears throat> what's happening to the trees? Why, does that, why do those leaves look like tornado when they spin around like that? On a cloudy day, I can't see my shadow. So these are real life applications for just talking about the weather and then going and experiencing the weather. <clears throat> so which activity seems like it has more opportunity for content rich learning? Here's a worksheet, perfectly fine to use, a worksheet that has fall leaves on it. But, you know, here we're getting one input and one output. They're counting the leaves and they're writing the numbers. So we're seeing if they can count the leaves and we're seeing if they can construct the number that goes along with them. If we take this outside and we do this in our journal, say, I want you to find me five maple, four maple leaves and five beechwood tree leaves, or you know, just bring me back five leaves. They can, you can turn it into a game. And then we're touching the leaves. We're seeing the shapes of the leaves. Why does this leaf have holes in it? Lots of questions that go along with it. And you, you can see right then and there on the spot, who can bring me five leaves? Who can give, bring me five green leaves? Who can bring me five leaves with the little pointy teeth on it? Um, who can bring me back acorns, five acorns with the top? So uh, this is just a different approach, but it, the domains of learning as we talked about, this can span several different domains of learning. So this is why um, you know, we do this. And it's a lot more fun for the kids because they think they're playing a game, but what you're really doing is making these decisions and possibly writing them down or videotaping them. Um, we have a GoPro camera, which I'm gonna start using more of, that we can strap on our chest. So you have video documentation. Which of those kids knew about those leaves? And which of those, you know, and it's okay if they don't wanna do it right away. You might have a special specific time for the journal. All right, everybody's from this pile of leads. Everybody glue five into your journal. So just a, a different approach. And here is um, when we did some leaf work. Um, we actually turned this into a really neat game. What we did was uh, I pulled out some string and some clothespins. And the kids were pinning up leaves. And we turned it into a game of if you find a brown leaf, you get one point. If you find a green leaf, you get two points. If you find a red leaf, because remember this is fall, if you find a red leaf, you get three points. And if you find a yellow leaf, you get four points. So the kids were running around finding, finding the different color leaves and giving themselves points. And they were saying, Miss Paula, how many points do I have now? How many points? I have three points now. Adding to my two points, how many points is this now if I combine it? So this turned into an impromptu math activity at first. I totally thought everyone was just going to hang up leaves and it would look like beautiful garland and it turned into a game. Another reason why I like nature education is that you, know, you can think on your toes and I really enjoy the creativity and the, uh, that comes along with that. Child-led learning. At the guided play end of the playful learning span, teachers might enhance children's exploration and learning by commenting on their discoveries, co-playing along with the children, asking open-ended questions about what the children are finding or exploring the materials in ways that children might not have thought to do. Now remember we said before, you can be an information giver and an entertainer, but you're not there to give all the information and to be the entertainer. You're guiding them, we call teachers guides. Um, the premise is that children learn best and rise to their full potential when they're allowed to lead the way and explore subjects when they feel ready. If you have, if it's, if it's fall and you're talking about leaves and all of a sudden you're talking about dinosaurs, that's child-led learning. <laughs> you're doing it right if, uh, if you have this great plan, like I said, with the boy and the berries, um, and then the children take over with what something, some stream of consciousness that they come up with when they hear the word leaves or they hear the word maple syrup or whatever you're learning about. Uh, teachers are facilitators and guides. Um, the absorption of content is much greater because we saw in that little pyramid, you're learning by doing. And students feel empowered and responsible for their learning. 
So, <clears throat> um, you know, they see learning in a really positive light when they're in control of their learning. Now, you might be able to, you know, finagle it in a way where you, you know, you kind of set the stage, like we said in the first piece, when you're planting the seeds. But um, when they feel like they can learn what they want to learn when they're ready to learn it, they feel responsible in that, in that case to feel more positive about the learning experience. Here we've got pumpkins. The children decided that that, that day they were going to do whatever they wanted to their pumpkin. And that was to do with your pumpkin that day. It was yours for the taking. So that was a really fun activity. So here is an example of childhood learning. We have Miss Sophie, and she pulled a book and put it in her backpack just to read on the trail, and it was a book of poems. It was a book called Dirt on My Shirt by Jeff Foxworthy. And she started reading poems, and the children were very interested in the poems because they were really funny. So then later on that day, actually, Miss, uh, one of the children suggested when we got to one of our comfortable stopping points that they would like to write their own poem about fall. So Miss Sophie dictated while each child said a line of the poem. Then a couple weeks later, we had a Harvest Moon outdoor family gathering get together. And we were talking about how great the moon was with all these similes and metaphors. It's so big. It's like a big, giant, bright flashlight. And then the children the next day after that decided that they wanted to make moons in their journal in a night sky and write a poem about the moon. So that was great, a great moment for us because we said, oh, they really remembered that lesson about poems and we're really going for what they, what they want to do. Here's our poem. The leaves are red, the sky is white, and every night is cold. The leaves are rainbows. The gnomes are scuffling all around to find winter food. So um, November 2nd is Max's birthday. And I will be six years old then. The horns are sharp and the trees are bare. In November, I love my sister Violet, her birthday on November 11th. The dark clouds are scattered across the sky and there's nothing we can do about it. The clouds are wispy blue and the moon is as round as a beanbag and I see a rainbow out there. Very beautiful. Um, the kids each added a sentence to this poem. Miss Sophie dictated, they cut it out and they highlighted their spot, the, the part that they contributed. And you can even make a lesson out of this if they're interested. The moon is as round as a beanbag. Hey, that's a simile. So you can even take what the kids have made for you. They made this and then we can use it as our, as our guide. And again, they feel empowered and responsible for their learning. Here's our wild nature play. It spans all domains of learning. Like I said, some are simultaneous and some are quick. Um, it allows educators to passively observe. This is great for if you would like to get pictures or if you'd like to look at a child more individually. Are they leading? Are they following? Are they using materials in different ways? Because the children think, you know, they're just playing, we know better. We know that they're learning a whole bunch of things out there. And when you give them their wild nature play time, this is a chance for you to gather a lot of data. And students feel empowered, again, through play work. Uh, Maria Montessori said, play is the work of the child. Play is the work, toys are the tools. And outdoor ed is great because the toys are different in each area because they're natural items. And they have multiple uses, and they're great opportunities to see, seize more info, like we said, with the, with the leaves, how many things we could do with those leaves. There's no 10 blocks. We don't carry toys. Um, I may say instead, please go collect me 10 sticks and tie them together with this string. Then it may spawn a lesson on groups of 10, counting by 10, or it may just be a race to 10. Who can bring me 10 sticks first? In which case, you can see which students follow the directions and tie them. And for here, you can see who's ready for more. Some will go off and some will play, you know, go back to their wild nature play, but who's ready for more? And who's, who's gonna make a, you know, new uses for the sticks? Can we play pretend with them? Can we make a, pretend to make a fire? So and all this can be measured through documenting, through physical writing of documenting and then pictures. So here we go, this leads right into it. How do teachers 
harvest the medical information. We planted, we cultivated, now it's time to harvest what we have. How teachers compile data through work samples. Um, that would be through your journals and uh, loose work and provocations. Pictures and videos, which will probably be the meat of what you use. <clears throat> the, probably the most abundant. Um, dictation, which I'll talk about in a moment. Documentation panels, which I'll talk about in a moment. And looking back learning, like we kind of talked about with the boy and the berries. What can we look back on? What did they really learn here? Here's an example of a loose work sample. We have a provocation and a response to the provocation. Um, for instance, here we were talking about space and stars. And we had some photos of nebulas, galaxies, red dwarfs, quarks, all these things, and some paint and chalk, and um, these, just these pictures that go along with it. So what can we see in response here? Well, up in the corner here, we can see somebody did a really great job of recreating this little galaxy. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't remember, um, creating these little things. And a lot of them look like, um, you know, we see something that might appear to look like stars where the kids were taking the brushes and shaking them onto the paper. Will the kids remember that this is a red dwarf, a quark, or whatever? No, I don't remember, and maybe they will, but it's spanning across those different domains, fine motor, spatial, maybe even spiritual here. You're talking about space. Uh, one of the things we'll talk about in the seminar, the full day seminar, is deciding what was learned. We can't really say so-and-so has learned about space by reading a book about space and doing ABC. Um, and there are verbs that can show us what a student may have gained from an experience or activity. Um, and I'll look into Bloom's taxonomy for answers. Join us next time. Um, adding pictures and dictation. Pictures are added weekly or bi-weekly. Um, I print them right out and they go right into the journals. Uh, the students sometimes help me cut them out, put them in their journals, sometimes I do it. Um, ask students to recall events using pictures as guides. So one way we might have a better understanding of the extent of what a child knows is to ask them to dictate the day. And we could compile this into a class web, a story, or use our pictures as a guide like I did here. The recollection of events can show us how the child perceived that activity. So here in this child's journal, this day we learned about buffalo and how to hunt them with sticks. So that's the blurb that I got from this child and I said I can then add on, I can say, what did we learn about buffalo and hunting with sticks? We had a moving buffalo, which was a moving hula hoop. How did we hunt the buffalo then versus here in this picture when I was, when the buffalo was standing still, was being, it was hanging from, the hula hoop was hanging from the barn. And then the uh, second one says, this day is when we ate lunch on a hay and we listened about possum's tail. And I was very surprised. Remember that story about possum's tail? What do you remember about it? What happened to possum's tail when it got too close to the sun? It burned or it burned all of the possum's hail, hair tail off. Tail hair, hair tail, tail hair off. <laughs> and um, so this was a great, jogging of the memory for the child, but also it was great for me to see, oh, okay, they really remember that story. Maybe I can use it another time. Or maybe I can reference it again since they remember it. Um, keeping picture dictation accessible. This is something that we definitely um, you know, can improve on, and it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Um, setting aside time each week to print out your pictures and display for the week. Here I display them with clothes pins and string and some leaves. Um, and pictures from the previous week go into the journals for dictation, and then the new pictures come up, and then a week later they go into the journals. And this can be hard because um, it, one great thing, a little tip I have is to label your pictures exactly. You can label the pictures and say, you know, Miss Paula reading sitting on hay. And that way when you go back to your pictures, you know exactly what you're looking for. And also, um, it helps the kids remember what they did and it helps you kind of, you know, stay on top of things. And you, you could do this with your co-teachers or you could set aside time each week, an hour each week to do this. Um, and then the last thing is documentation panels. Documentation panels are a great guide for teachers wanting to showcase the unit that you've done. Here the unit was trees. 
Um, some of the things that worked, some of the things that didn't work, this is a time for you and your staff to kind of talk about this. Um, when it's compiled, teachers can go back and take a look for ideas and inspiration and even for how to expand the learning. Um, and in the in-person session of this, I will show you, we have hundreds of documentation panels for our Nature Preschool Conference every year, and I can show you um, kind of how we lay them out with the pictures, and this is great to show parents as well. And one of the things I want to point out is um, these documentation panels also kind of remind me of something I did in college. Um, we had this method called the RSVP method, and it was research, self-reflection, vocation, and practice. So we've researched, you know, you research trees and you find the best activities for trees. You can self-reflect on your lesson with your staff, or with your co-teachers. You can it helps you remember why you do these things. You look back on it with a very much of a fondness. That's your vocation. You look all back on this with a fondness. Oh, remember when so-and-so made a tree hat? That was really a really cute activity. And then you kind of re remember why you're doing this. And then practice. What can we do better next time? And these documentation panels kind of lay out all the units very easily for you. Again, it takes work. Um, but sometimes if you want to keep doing things through the seasons, you might have to do this once, and then the next year you can pull it out again and look at it. So what was learned here? When you give a class a tarp, kind of like when you give a mouse a cookie. So I pulled out a tarp when it was raining, and I expected the students would make a shelter here. I even suggested it. But instead, the group decided to all walk together under the tarp. <clears throat> and here they learned the different sounds that the rain makes on the tarp versus on on their bare heads. Um, they tried to walk in step. They had to kind of start walking in step because kids were falling and the tarp was sliding off their heads. Um, and they started shuffling across the ground, which left really long, smooth tracks. He said, look, Miss, look, Miss Paula, these, these are long, smooth footprints. I said, yes. So th there was a lot of opportunities for different things to be learned. It was how to look for it. This is what I found. I gave them a tarp, thought they were going to drape it over a tree branch and make a shelter, and they were walking all over the forest floor with it. So that's looking back learning. Here's circling back learning or looking back learning. Um, <clears throat> I got a taxidermy fox out one day. This is not real. It's not like we have, it's not like we're Snow White and we have <laughs> animals just like floating to us. We, uh, this is a taxidermy fox. And the children had their journals out and some of them we're drawing pictures of the fox and making observations about the fox. And, you know, I didn't think of much of, of it at the time. I just thought, well, we're talking about creatures of the night, so this would be a great opportunity to pull out the taxidermy fox and get a closer look. And I thought that was the end of that until this happened. We found this in the meadow many weeks later. And the children deducted from the old lesson of the taxidermy fox that this was probably a skeleton of a fox. Because we can see, Miss Paula, it kind of looks like the fox's colors. And it's kind of as big as a fox would be. So we deducted that it was a fox. And no better way than to see it live to really have that memory. I don't think we're going to, I think next year when they come back, they're all going to remember the fox, the fox bones we found out in the meadow. And so that's a great example of circling back learning. And lastly, sharing the bounty. We've harvested and now we have a big bounty and we're gonna share it with our parents. How we share, there's me, uh, with progress notes. Irvine uses progress notes. Um, it's a lot of moving parts, it takes some time during progress note season. Don't talk to a preschool teacher because they're very busy. Um, and work can be distributed. Uh, a weekly blog, which I'll show you, which I do for my kindergarten program. Um, Social media, a Facebook page might be a good idea. Family participation pieces, um, like I said, like the campfires or a family meal. Parent groups, if you have a willing group, groups of parents that can help you print out things or set up things or tend a fire, you can use parents. Some of them are very happy to, to be used for different things. And uh, our homeschool reviews which is um, for the kindergarten model piece. Um, the parents just print the weekly blog right out and use it for their homeschool reviews. 
Here's an example of our progress notes. This is little Cora. This is her progress note. Uh, they're prepared before parent conferences to emphasize talking points. So if the parents have questions, they can formulate their questions through the use of the progress, the things we wrote on the progress note. It celebrates their accomplishments and sets goals. So we do one in the fall and one in the spring, and our fall one sets goals for the spring, and our spring one sets goals for next year. And parent conferences should emphasize work accomplished but eliminate bias. Example, we can't say, like I said before, she learned or she knows this or that <clears throat> because we're not sure. And um, we look here, this is what I'm going to talk about in the full day program of this. Um, <clears throat> and we use this as a guide. If we remember facts, we can list them. If we understand facts, we might be able to paraphrase them. If we apply facts, we might be able to classify things. So this, this is a great, um, it's great for your verbiage when you use, um, when you make those progress notes because um, we can't say, oh, she learned, we learned about this, we learned about that. We can say, maybe we could say that in general, but um, for each individual child when we're documenting their progress, we can't say they learned something if we're not sure if they actually learned it. So can they outline, can they estimate? Then we can know um, for sure. And we can have proof of that through the pictures and through the videos and through the dictation. Here's our weekly blog. Here's our four streamers blog. Um, it keeps track of presented materials week to week. All the pictures go in there. Um, it's very easy. We use WordPress and it's very easy, user friendly. It encourages families to extend topics to home life. And, and I know with my children, I ask them, what did you do today? Oh, we played. I'm sure you guys get that. We played. Um, so, uh, this is great for you to say, hmm, didn't you read an, a story about a turtle shell today? Didn't you read a folk tale about a turtle shell? Oh, yeah, we did. And that can spark that conversation. And then, like I said, they print this right out for homeschool reviews. And here's little Evelyn and her mom, including parents. So, I thought I had another slide out of that. So, we planted the seeds. And for planting, we're, we, we're talking about planning, mission statement, are you living up to your mission statement? Is your, is your stuff nature focused? Are you collaborating with your staff in a positive nature-based way? Then we cultivated, we, we used journals and play-based learning, child-led activities and work samples. And then we harvested photos, videos, observation and dictation. And lastly, there's our bounty, documentation panels, the blog, parent groups, and progress notes. So that's how Irvine does it. I'm, I'm curious to know if anybody else and how they do it, because I love learning about other different ways that people approach nature-based learning. I'm always ready to learn. So um, next time, we'll take a look at some different ways to take something and turning into measurable data by making big journals. We're going to make giant journals. Um, it might be easier in some ways to grab a worksheet about something, but we can brainstorm about how to approach each topic with the outdoors in mind, with the natural materials in mind. And we'll take a look at curriculum guides and decide how to incorporate. And then I'll sh I sh we'll show you the documentation panels and things like that. So it'll be a lot of hands-on fun stuff, the learning by doing, which we talked about. So that's my presentation, and I thank you very much. And I'm going to take it back over to Dave. Um, for anybody who has any questions, I'm re ready and willing to answer. Well, thanks very much for, for all of your insights, Paula, and for being willing to uh, answer some questions. We do have uh, several minutes to do so, and I'm going to invite uh, some folks to go ahead and ask questions, but we've got several that have already come in. And so let me, let me start, Paula, sure. by asking you, uh, I think, an interesting and valuable question from Jackie, who says, how do you balance engaging with the children with stepping back to record an observation? Oh, great question. Um, and it's very hard to balance because I think as teachers, we want to we want to come in, we want to show them everything we know. We want to show them, we want what's best for them. We want, we want them to learn. But uh, I always try to remember that 50% of our lesson is somewhat presented. So somewhat, guys, let's, let's read a, po a book of poems today like Miss Sophie did. 
and then 50%. So if I see, if I find myself getting a little too wordy and a little too teachy about things, I step back and say half this class has to be the child-led, child, you know, nature-based, wild nature play. And that's where I, so if I, if I notice in the beginning of class we're talking a really long time about something, if the kids are into it, great. But if, you know, if you see about half interested, maybe it's a good time to add your second 50%, which is the wild nature play. You might say, keep in mind what we talked about with, with sticks and how to use sticks as, um, as tools. Maybe when you're out playing, you could find some sticks and you could kind of just set them off, send them off with a, with a something to think about. So you're still, you're, you're, you're still in their brain, but they have that chance to do the wild nature play. And so you're saying that 50% of the time uh, that they're engaged in wild nature play is your emphasis then is on observation and assessment more than it is on interaction? Yes, and it, it really depends. Like some children, when we go out to a certain area, they are off. Like they, they're off playing and they, they forget an adult is there. Some kids are ready for some, a little bit of one-on-one of -on -one time, so that's a great time for you to give that to them. And um, you might even say, like, this time I want you guys to all play in the stream and, you know, that's the time where you can make sure you get your documentation, pictures and videos. And other times, yes, you can engage with the children who are ready for something more or ready to expand on a topic. I usually, when we get to a wild nature play situation, I spread out a blanket and sit down. And that, that's kind of the signal that, you know, this is time to play and, and explore, you know, but I'm always there. and Anybody can come onto the blanket anytime. Okay. So uh, let me go on to another question. This is one from Anjali who asks, how much staff time does it take to produce these methods of documenting like journals, pictures, panels, blogs, videos, et cetera? Um, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> uh, we, uh, as teachers, we, we do much more than we probably get credit or get paid for sometimes. Um, but we, uh, it's just about striking a balance in a working system with the picture system, it's really easy for us because each Friday afternoon, I set aside an hour to print out pictures. I set aside um, that time to also write, write up the blog, and then um, I print out the pictures. And that's something I do in my hour on a, on a Friday. Uh, for journals, um, the journals, the dictation piece, it can happen during wild nature play. I might call someone over when I'm sitting on my blanket and say, you know, would you like to look at your pictures now? And that's, I do that kind of wild, the wild nature play is happening. That's what's so great about wild nature play is, is you can get things accomplished, the adult things accomplished if you so choose or you can go play. Um, but if you have a lot of things like this is a great time to say, you know, who would like, you know, now it's wild nature play time. Who would like to help me cut out? Would anybody like to help me cut out the pictures? And then just see if and the children are willing to help. And then the parent piece is also important. If the parents are willing to help in any way um, you can also dictate some of that to the parents if you have a, a parent that wants to be a class parent or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paula, we've got just a, sure. another minute or two and a lot of good questions. So oh. uh, let me ask this one. Uh, Michelle asks, do you do any assessment for single day field trip programs? In other words, where groups are coming to you. So this is not in your nature-based preschool, but single day field trip programs with, with young, ch young children. And how do, related to that is, how would you collect data and share progress with a teacher? Um, I do not do field trips. That's a whole nother department. Um, and I know they have their special um, <clears throat> sort of things that they present. Like right now they're presenting with maple syrup, how to make, get sap from the trees and make maple syrup with it. And I know they have sort of a little lesson that goes along with field trips. And I know that lesson is given to the teachers but I'm not sure about the, the, the depth of, of what they do because I don't do the, those programs. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, so let me jump quickly then to, sure. to uh, Sarah who asks uh, an important question. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, what about privacy issues in taking and showing photos? Um, we have a, um, a little form that they fill out to decide um, to say if, if they would like to be photographed or not. And it's, um, I know the director of the preschool, she has a form they fill out. And if they're not comfortable sharing their photos, then I might just share them with the parents personally um, and put it in just their journals rather than 
put it on a blog. I haven't run into that yet, but um, but it's it's something that you know we can keep in mind, and, and we don't have to share with everyone. Um, if, if there is a privacy issue, we can definitely share more privately and just go in their individual journals and they won't be photographed for um, these kinds of purposes like webinars or marketing or anything like that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for oh. questions. Uh, we do hit, still have some. And uh, so, Paula, let me ask you, would you be willing to respond to people uh, directly, say, via email if they have questions that we didn't get to? Absolutely. Okay, well, that, uh, that would be great. Um, let me remind everybody, as we're wrapping up, that again, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have full day versions, full day workshops that are much more detailed and hands-on explorations of the topics that have been covered in the three webinars that we've done this month. And we would certainly encourage you to consider attending one of those full day workshops if it's near you. One of those sites is the is Irvine Nature Center, uh, which is in Owings Mills, Maryland, just outside of Baltimore. So those of you who are uh, in the mid-Atlantic states uh, probably are, are within reach of that for a day long workshop. Uh, another site is uh, on the West Coast in Seattle specifically at Fiddleheads Forest School. And the third site um, is at Nature's Way Preschool, which is uh, run by the Kalamazoo Nature Center in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and, and should be close enough to those of you, at least who are in that part of the world, Chicago area and, and uh, Michigan uh, and Northern uh, Indiana, uh, probably within reach of that. Um, uh, each of the sites uh, will be hosting um, the three workshops. Uh, you don't, once again, need to copy all this down, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you will get a link to this, um, to the recorded version of this presentation. And if you, uh, if you want to uh, explore it sooner than that, um, we do have a, a website that you can go to. And um, for some reason that slide is not coming up. Um, but uh, if you'll just Google uh, Natural Start Alliance, training. So the key word there is training, Natural Start Alliance, and it'll take you to the um, really a whole website that, that covers in much more detail uh, what these workshops are, when they're being held, where they're being held, uh, how you can register for them, and some background on the presenters as well. So once again, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, Paula, you'd be interested to know that uh, we've we had some uh, some folks in from again Brazil and Australia. I can't I can't quite imagine what time it is there. How early they've gotten to excellent, to <laughs> yeah. In Australia, but we're glad to have you there. And uh, for all of you who are a little closer to home, um, I also we uh, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again either on a webinar, a webinar, or in person at a full day workshop. Yeah. And finally, thank you again, Paula, for for sharing your experience and wisdom with us today. Well, thank you all for, for listening to me talk for an hour. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and close and um, call it an afternoon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.